again, welcome to everyone uh, to our session today titled Building and Maintaining Your Local Immigrant Infrastructure. Um, quick thank you to our sponsors of this, the uh, interactive today, Walmart and Western Union. Um, again, thank you for sponsoring the full Welcoming 21 uh, interactive. Um, housekeeping items, just really quickly. Again, questions, if you've got any at any point, use the chat feature, any of your questions there, whether they be technical questions about the platform or content questions about the uh, presentation itself. We're gonna use some time toward the end and get to as many questions as time allows. And then finally, please, if you are uh, able to stay active on social media with us, share what you're learning today using the hashtag interactive2021. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers joining us today. Uh, we're being joined first by Julia Glantz and um, Johanna Cooper. Julia is the city administrator uh, with the city of Salisbury, Maryland. And Johanna is the community engagement fellow for vulnerable populations, also with the city of Salisbury, Maryland. We're also being joined by Dr. Jesus Martinez, the Executive Director of the Central Valley Immigrant Integration Collaborative, or CVIIC. And joining us from Canada, we're very excited to have Paulina Vizhakowski, who is the Director of the Toronto South LIP Local Immigration Partnership, as well as Doug Olthoff, who is the co-leader of the National LIP Local Immigration Partnership Secretariat. Very excited to have all of them joining us today and sharing their uh, expertise with you. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Julia, who's going to go ahead and get us started. Well, good afternoon to everybody. Good morning to our West Coasters, uh, Jesus and others. Uh, we're so excited to be with you. So thank you for uh, putting everything together for the interactive. Uh, Anthony and uh, Melissa, really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a first initial poll uh, that we'd like to launch to um, you know, keep this a little more engaging um, and, uh, and keep, you, keep you on your toes. So just uh, curious, feel free to fill those out and uh, we'll chat about some of them along the way. Uh, but as you're filling that out, um, we wanted to tell you a little bit about Salisbury, Maryland. So we're on the Eastern shore of Maryland about uh, two and a half hours from DC surrounded by the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. And the city's population is about 33,000 residents and we are eagerly awaiting uh, the census 2020 results and uh, hoping they are as, as accurate as we, we could have been in the, in the challenging year we had. Uh, and we have a county of uh, a population of uh, over 100,000 as well. Um, and we have a really uh, diverse group of folks that live in our community. Uh, we are uh, now a majority minority community. Uh, we entered uh, that new phase of our community in 2018. Um, and so it, it leaves, uh, you know, puts a lot of responsibility on the city and on our organizations to make sure we're communicating with uh, all folks in a way that is accessible to them. Uh, so uh, in our community, we have uh, a large Hispanic and Latinx community, Haitian Creole and Korean. Um, three of the top five languages spoken in Salisbury uh, are AAPI languages, Asian, and, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander languages. Um, so it's as we are entering sort of uh, a, a new world for us in, in, in trying to be very proactive and reach all of these communities, um, you know, we have to be very intentional about uh, making sure we're, we're reaching out to everybody because it is such a broad group. Um, and you can see some of the uh, different uh, um, uh, uh, industries that make up our community um, that uh, can be a little bit challenging in, in reaching folks as well. Um, so if you'll launch that second poll, Anthony, and we can go to the next slide as well. So uh, the reason that we're here today, Johanna and I, uh, is because of our work with the Vulnerable Populations Task Force. Um, and Anthony, I think there's some text there if we can, uh, there we go. Uh, so in, in 2020, uh, in the world of COVID, uh, I uh, um, was uh, involved in many of the, the COVID uh, issues and trying to 
um, you know, make sure everybody was safe and healthy and uh, kept our team alive and well, uh, and was frequently hitting my head against a wall with uh, the barriers that were uh, in our community. Uh, not being able to, to effectively communicate with other agencies, um, folks falling through the, through the cracks, the giant cracks that were always there, but were much more apparent during COVID. Uh, and, and many more of us are now aware of them uh, if they weren't before. So uh, we pulled together a group of folks. Uh, I think the initial email list was about 150 people that um, uh, were involved with vulnerable populations, served vulnerable populations, were of themselves vulnerable populations. Uh, and when I say that, I mean uh, minorities, non-native English speakers, uh, immigrants, uh, seniors, young people, LGBT folks, homeless, the, the whole gamut. So it's a really diverse group and there's never been anything quite like it uh, in our community. And as I'm talking to more and more people about this work, uh, there's not a lot of, of communities that have groups like this. Um, so we started in May of 2020 and we just celebrated a year of meeting literally every week on Zoom. Uh, and we were able to get together last year, uh, last week at our amphitheater to, to celebrate uh, the majority of us being vaccinated and, uh, and the work we've been doing. So I do just wanna get a little bit in the weeds of the structure, because I think it's really helpful if, if you're interested in standing up something that's similar in your community. Um, so we meet once a, once a week as a whole group, and there's probably 60 people on there on average, and we have a facilitator. So we're lucky enough to have a mediation and facilitation nonprofit in the community that has uh, volunteered their time to lead this effort. Um, and so that is a, a coming of, of uh, together, we share out information, we bring guest speakers to raise awareness on different issues that uh, are in the community. And uh, the, the work really happens in these subgroups. So uh, some of the examples that are, are pertinent to this, this session, uh, we have a Latinx group, a language group, and an information sharing group. Um, so we realized early on that whether folks realize we have such a diverse community and a community that speaks so many different languages or not, or just didn't slow down to think about it, uh, or just relied on language line or whatever the case may be, uh, that we really had to, to slow people down to, to talk about language, to, to make sure we were getting information out there. Um, so our groups, uh, that just those couple examples work, they meet every week uh, and, and work to, to break down some of these barriers. Uh, we also have uh, one-stop shop events that Johanna will touch on in a minute. And uh, it's really been an opportunity to collaborate with uh, you know, leaders from the hospital, the health department, every type of, of nonprofit that's out there um, and, and really communicate in a way that that's never happened before and, and all be on the same page and working in the same direction. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, sort of a, a continuing ed for everybody in this work. Um, so I think there's uh, another poll um, and the next slide for, uh, I think, Johanna to take over. And oh, there's a text. So the one-stop shop events are really the flagship piece of the Vulnerable Populations Task Force. Um, and again, these got started um, a year ago last May. Um, and so these are events, community resource fairs, um, where residents are able to come together and access food um, and other resources in education, healthcare, social services, legal services, kind of the whole variety. Um, we tried to make it as holistic as possible. But one of the most important things is that we take a lot of pride in respecting the dignity and worth of all individuals that come. Um, and so as a result, it feels more like a community gathering um, instead of a charity type event, which I think has been really important. Um, we try to make sure that residents are connected um, in, an, in an effective manner and in a way that is um, kind of comprehensive rather than just getting individuals in and out um, as quickly as possible. We're making sure they're connected um, in to the furthest extent possible. Um, and so some of our partners um, include the Maryland Food Bank who provided fresh produce and other non-perishable items. Um, one interesting piece too that has come about recently is that we've tried to make sure the food that we're providing is um, culturally responsive. Um, so ensuring that residents of different backgrounds and different cultures are getting access to foods that they would traditionally eat or um, making sure those dietary pieces are met there. Um, and these events are usually held in um, communities that are traditionally underserved 
um, areas that are difficult to access for transportation or other reasons, um, really bringing these services to the folks um, that need them most. Um, and then another piece there is um, interpreters and translated materials. Um, we have every time we go out, we have Spanish and Haitian Creole interpreters on site, um, and then some Korean um, interpreters as well. And all of the promotional materials for these events are provided in those languages as well. And then we really encourage all of the partners that come out um, to have materials option or available in other languages as well. Again, to make sure that folks are connected in an effective manner rather than just kind of knowing about the services um, available that way. Um, and next slide, please. And so um, outside of these one-stop shop events, we wanted to talk about the impact of the, low, of the Vulnerable Populations Task Force. Um, it began with COVID information sharing, testing efforts, things of that nature. Um, the group was responsible for organizing a large testing effort at some of our um, poultry and food processing plants, which is a rather large employer for us. Um, and then it has since kind of shifted into a variety of other things, including um, the COVID vaccine efforts. So one example is that we partnered with um, the local hospital to get blocks of appointment times that we could use um, to reach folks that don't speak English, our immigrant residents um, and kind of other populations that would have a more difficult time navigating those, um, those systems. Um, and this is really important because prior to the convening of this group, that would have never happened. If we had turned to them um, in kind of peak vaccine efforts and said, could we have a block of 500 appointments um, that never would have happened. So that is just one example of how we were able to reduce some of the barriers that exist um, to ensure that the residents that kind of needed it the most were connected to a resource like that. Um, and then with language access as well, um, Julia touched on it, but really just making sure that all of the service providers, including internally within the group and within the city's efforts, um, that folks realize the importance of it and how necessary it is to connect those with limited English proficiency to those um, vital services and, and ensuring that, that that's done more effectively. Um, we've also um, just recently launched a community art campaign, um, which we actually got the model from a Welcoming America conference um, to really target um, immigrant communities and try to address some of the vaccine hesitancies by um, increasing buy-in and, and um, and awareness and import or involvement in this particular work. Um, we've worked with um, representatives in our state um, legislature. So we have a senator who has attended our meetings on a very regular basis um, and has helped with two really key things, I think. Um, the first is involvement in um, allowing all residents, regardless of citizenship status, to be included in the state stimulus package, which was not um, the case previously. So that just happened earlier this year, um, which I think was really exciting. And again, an example of how bringing this group together um, kind of brought that piece of the conversation forward. Um, and then the second piece is recently they just passed um, a bill to establish an Office of Immigration Services in our state, which we had not had previously. Um, and the Senator shared with us that she brought a lot of the conversations she heard us having in the larger group and in the language access group to that um, and try to promote that in, in establishing that model. Um, and so overall, I think really the largest piece is that it broke down those silos that we talked about before and folks who would have otherwise not come together to have conversations are now together. And there's this overall increased awareness of the importance to establish um, an inclusive and really welcoming community um, for all of our residents. And I'll pass it back to Julia. Thanks, Johanna. Nancy, I think we have another poll as uh, I get started on this slide as well. So one of the things um, <clears throat> that uh, we have really found, and, I, and I'm sure many of you have, um, and Anthony, if you could hit to bring up the text as well, um, that is our, our need to meet people where they are. Um, so our, our service providers are doing that. We're, we're going to our folks. We're, we're going to uh, you know community parks to host these events, these one-stop shops. Um, there's the expectation to come to City Hall is uh, can no longer be the way that we operate in, in 2021. Um, so we, we've changed our operating model. Um, and uh, one of the other really cool things that we've started to do is uh, you know, greater use of inclusive language on logos and signage on websites. Um, so a simple example, um, and again, a, a lot of stuff is just really simple that, uh, but, but goes a long way into building trust and creating that safe space for folks in our community. 
is uh, we used to have a tab on our website that said citizen services. Uh, and you'd click it and you could you know, order another trash can or, or request a park for an event or things like that. And through this, we realized, okay, we really shouldn't be using the word citizen. We should be using a uh, resident or some other, so, some other term. So we've, we've started to change our language. Um, here you can see a, a flagpole sign or a, a light pole sign in our downtown. Um, and we've started to use uh, the, the tagline, all are welcome. Uh, and that came out of uh, a pride pride banner that we had and we took it uh, and it is uh, on a lot of our materials moving forward. And so um, we've just uh, opened a new community garden and uh, for the first time, we are gonna have uh, language on our um, you know, public facing signage in our community uh, in multiple languages. So this community garden is in a, a, a minority or a majority minority neighborhood with, with Spanish and Haitian Haitian Creole speaking folks. Um, so the signage is gonna be in, in that language. And uh, until recently, we never thought about doing that, even though our population, uh, many of them don't speak English. So uh, through some of this work, we, we're changing how we, how we operate. Um, you know, we've started to uh, uh, be more involved in celebrating different um, uh, uh, holidays of, of the folks that live in our community. So for the first time, uh, we, uh, we, have, we have celebrated Haitian Flag Day for a number of years, but this past year, on January 1st, we celebrated Haitian Independence Day, um, which was really well received uh, by our Haitian, uh, Haitian friends in, in Salisbury. Um, and we've kickstarted our efforts through some of the CDBG funds that we got uh, in our community, some, some uh, funds that came down from the state uh, to put towards translation services, interpretation services uh, for printing materials and things like that. But we know moving forward, we have to put uh, a line item for this work or else it's not gonna happen. Or, or we're gonna be cheating people in our community that should be paid for the services to provide interpretation or translation services. So uh, we're trying to put our, our money where our mouth is here. And Johanna has spent the last year creating a uh, Welcome to Salisbury Guide. Uh, that is a, a document that uh, will be at these events, live on our website, be in multiple languages, that really is a, a front-facing document for folks that are new to Salisbury, that are uh, uh, you know, not, not born here and uh, you know, need to figure out, you know, how do I manage housing? How do I manage healthcare? All of those things. Um, and then finally, we're trying to uh, you know, be more inclusive in, in how we educate our folks on the expectations of, of being residents in Salisbury. So instead of just slapping you with a, a fine and a, a citation for not mowing your grass, we should probably tell you that's the expectation to mow your grass and to keep it at a certain length in the language that you speak. Um, so we're, 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 we're doing some of this work uh, and it's, it's small, but it's a start um, and we're really excited about it. So um, and next slide, Anthony. Uh, and finally, uh, we're working with, with the Vulnerable Populations Task Force to develop a community interpreter and translator bank. So anybody in the community can, can look at this document, know who's available, what they charge, do they charge, uh, not have to rely on language line because we know it's a, a really frustrating uh, resource for many people. And uh, continuing with our, our celebration of, of cultural specific holidays, uh, Johanna's working on launching a, a cooking class uh, that celebrates different cultures, which I think was also another um, uh, welcoming America uh, tip that we got from some other community um, and, and the, the cookbook that you all put together. And uh, Johanna also spent the last year putting together a plan um, that maps forward how we address um, these areas with, uh, you know, goals and, and, um, and priorities because we have been going at it sort of piecemeal. Um, so we've gotten buy-in from a number of different groups in the community to, to map out our plan forward. And then finally, um, I've said it from the beginning that as we put this group together, you know, COVID is gonna go away one day, hopefully soon. And uh, we know that this task force, this group of people is not just gonna fold down and go back to however we were operating before in our silos that we are gonna tackle the next issue uh, that is pressing in our community. So I hope that you're all able to, uh, to stand up something similarly. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Um, our emails are on the next slide, uh, but we're really excited to, to share some of the great work that we've been doing here and looking forward to hearing from everybody else today. Great, thank you so much, Julie and Johanna. That was amazing. Um, couple of really quick questions uh, for you before we move on to our next speaker here uh, that came in. 
Uh, one is you touched on a lot of the different uh, community events and, and things that you did out there. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, specifically the resource fair that you put together um, and give any maybe kind of high overview tips on how to create something like that? What are some of the steps that you put into kind of getting that up and running? Yeah, so Johanna, jump in if I leave something out, but our, our one-stop shop events, we have them in uh, multiple times a month in uh, varying uh, locations and not just in Salisbury and White Comico, we've, we've spread out a little bit to some other other counties here, um, trying to not, not hit the same folks t multiple times. Um, but, you know, you, you've got to think through, you know, where you're hosting it, uh, is it uh, you know sensitive to everybody that you want to show up? Uh, is it at a church? Is what what kind of um, you know uh, challenges can that cause? Is it at a school? Um, we go out and do a site visit with multiple vendors to make sure the flow works well. Um, we really um, we we partnered with a group that um, uh, did wanted to do a drive through. Um, and really the goal was to, to get them food and to get out as quickly as possible, which really went against our mission of trying to problem solve in that moment, connect folks to resources. So we want them to park and then, you know, we'll have volunteers carry the boxes of food that are, you know, 25 pounds or something. Uh, so having, having uh, strong folks to, to lug boxes for a couple hours is important. Um, and then, you know, making sure that you're um, I'll, I'll use us for an example. We have a department here, it's called Housing and Community Development um, and has code enforcement and some other things in it. Um, but nobody really knows what that means, Housing and Community Development, as a person just coming to, thinking they're just coming to get food and then we, we sort of uh, surround them with the services. The food is the, the carrot to get them there. Um, and so just thinking through what does your signage say? Uh, is it understandable to, to anybody that is new to the area, new to you know, your city? Um, to think through what, what they're going to think you are, because they're not going to come to your table if they don't understand um, what you're offering. Um, so those would be a couple of tips I'd suggest. Excellent. And just curious too, what has the community reaction been to these things that you've been doing, uh, especially at the beginning of it? You know, was there initial, um, you know, real encouragement and energy around it, or did it take a while to kind of build and build that trust in what you're doing? Um, I, you know, overall, it's been tremendous. Um, and I, again, I think as we've gone through a little longer, um, you know, folks realize it's, it's not just about the food that we're giving out and that you can, um, that you can get more services while you're there. And, and Johanna mentioned it, but it is, it's sort of like if you're coming to a, a family reunion or something, it's because we, you know, we make it feel like a safe place. Um, that folks know that they're, that they're going to be okay there. And it's not, you know, I've got to hurry and just get my stuff and get out because this is embarrassing and I need help. Um, so we, we've tried to really make it a, a welcoming environment. Um, but more, more broadly for, you know, folks that aren't in, in this work in the day to day, you know, take our, uh, you know, our, our car uh, companies here, um, you know, they want to, they want to throw money at this and, you know, help amplify our efforts. Uh, because they see the the magnitude of, of the work we're doing, so uh, we're trying to figure out ways to to take to take that money and to continue to uh, serve serve our folks in a in a in a better way. Excellent. Well, again, Julia and Johanna, thank you both so much for sharing all of these great examples. Um, reminder too, if you got questions that, that come up after we move on from here, uh, we're going to still take some time at the end for general questions. So if you've got a question for either Johanna or Julia later on, enter them in there and we'll address them at the end there. But at this point, we're going to go ahead and turn over now and welcome uh, Jesus Martinez from the Central Valley Immigrant Integration Collaborative. Uh, and Jesus, I will let you take it away. Thank you very much, Anthony, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And good afternoon, everyone who is joining us from throughout the uh, US and also Canada. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly about some of the work that we have done here in the Central Valley of California in collaboration with many different partner organizations. So if you can go to the next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, this is going to be the content in general terms of our presentation today. A little bit of background on immigrants in California Central Valley, a little bit of info about the model regional collaboration and coordination that we have put in place here uh, since 2013. 
um, some reference to the work that we've done uh, regarding the 2020 census and how it also expanded the network of organizations that we've been collaborating with over the years. And also the current post census priorities that we are embarking on that include immigration, but also go beyond and include other matters. Next, please. So uh, very briefly in this map, as you can see, what uh, we call the Central Valley includes what you see in the map as Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valley. The work that my organization and the partners that we work with do uh, centers in the San Joaquin Valley, that very large green area there that uh, as you can tell just from a uh, visual point, uh, it's much larger than the greater LA area. It's much larger than San Francisco Bay area, the two places in California that have the highest population density. And we have people living in these communities all over the Central Valley. So it isn't just in one location. And obviously it takes you hours to go from one end to the other. Next slide, please. Um, if you can click again to have the other panel. There we go, thank you. So just a little bit of info about uh, the immigrants in this region of California. And this is largely from information that was generated in 2013 and 2014 as part of our strategic plan that was uh, finished in 2014. Uh, so the San Joaquin Valley includes eight counties from south to north, Kern, Kings, Tulare, Fresno, Madera, Merced, Stanislaus, and San Joaquin. This is an area that has about 10,000 square miles and a total population of around 4 million people. The important thing for us is that the population that we tried to serve numbered about 900,000 people uh, in these eight counties. And in addition to that, there were over half a million children with at least one immigrant parent. So when we talk about immigrant families here, we're talking about a population that is about a million and a half, which is considerable. And again, spread all over uh, the Central Valley. Uh, further breakdown, about 300,000 people are naturalized citizens, some 260 non-citizen, but documented permanent residents and whatever else. Uh, and also a very large undocumented population, uh, over uh, about a third of a million people. 93% uh, of the immigrants here are of Latino origin. And within that, the majority are also of Mexican origin. Um, about 6% were Asian. We have very large Hmong population here in Fresno, but also, for example, a very significant Filipino population, Sikh immigrants as well, uh, and others. And What's important also about the work that we began to carry out in 2013 when we launched a very small pilot project dealing with DACA. At that point in time, 2013, January 2013, to serve this population of 900,000 people, there were only eight or nine accredited representatives working for nonprofit legal services providers in the entire Central Valley. So that was about 100,000 people per accredited representative. And if you're familiar with this status, it means that you're not a lawyer, you have some capacity and training to provide some immigration services, but it is not an, an attorney. And there was only one attorney working part-time for one of the partner organizations involved in this effort. So a region with a very large population and very limited legal capacity to assist them with DACA and other issues. Um, and further exacerbate the situation, uh, the legal service providers that existed, they were nonprofit, were based in the large urban centers, Fresno, Kern County, uh, Modesto, Stockton. But if you went to a rural community, a uh, medium-sized city, there were, there were no nonprofit legal service providers. And the local community organizations also had very limited knowledge and expertise in dealing with immigration issues. So this was a uh, you know, very significant problem that we faced at that point in time. And when um, Donald Trump came to the White, to the White House in 2017, we also realized that none of the nonprofit legal service providers in the region had any attorney with any expertise, uh, any capacity to assist people who are in removal proceedings. So we had to look for alternatives and resources elsewhere, including the Bay Area. Um, fortunately, since 2013, the situation has improved. The number of organizations involved has grown. Their capacity has also increased. And one of the ways in which that this has taken place is by having legal services agencies from the San Francisco Bay Area and the LA area established satellite offices here in the Central Valley. So to give an idea, we developed a regional um, directory of nonprofit legal service providers. The first version of that 
of that directory that we developed in 2013, 14 was one page long. And the current version that we updated in March of this year was seven pages long with many more organizations involved providing a much broader range of services. Next slide, please, Anthony. So how did we begin to uh, do the work and what led us to create what we now call Civic? Uh, again, this um, Civic was created formally in 2014 in February, but um, the actual predecessor of Civic is the Central Valley DACA Collaborative that we began to establish in January, 2013 through a very small uh, DACA project that provided mini grants, tiny grants to three community-based organizations and also three legal service providers that existed here. And through that work, uh, a number of other organizations began to uh, also participate in the efforts. There were adult schools, there were clinics, uh, there were um, pro bono attorneys, uh, libraries, um, media partners, particularly the serve Spanish language communities. And they all wanted to participate in these efforts. But what we began to learn through this initial efforts in 2013 was that there was obviously a very large uh, gap in the capacity that existed to serve this population and we needed to address it. We also found through this initial work in 2013 that there was uh, a lot of misinformation about the different immigration programs that existed and who could benefit. So for example, many people thought that DACA was only for college students. So it didn't really, um, it, it, many people did not know that they could qualify for DACA, apply for it uh, and be able to benefit from, from its uh, state and federal uh, benefits. We also uh, realized and oh. documented actually that there was widespread immigration fraud yes, carried out by notarios and other individuals um, that were charging people, that were defrauding them, that were doing very badly with the applications that they filled out, including charging people for things oh, that they were not really eligible for. And obviously a lot of mistrust among immigrant communities and um, that lack of services in rural communities, particularly in others. So, these were some of the problems, but there were also the things that we began to identify that could help us improve the situation, which was that there was a lack you can of regional coordination of the services and efforts that were taking place and that we needed to improve the coordination in order to maximize the use of the existing resources. And there was also very little, almost no funding for DACA. Uh, in 2013, when we launched this tiny project, uh, that there was only one small foundation that was providing funding and one, um, the state bar of California was also providing funding to three local legal services providers. And that was it. There was no other funding for DACA in 2013 and funding did not come around to much later in the process. Next slide, please. So Civic um, began to be created and established as a result of conversations and dialogues that we had in October, 2013, and then formally established in, Jan in February, 2014 as a way of promoting the coordination and collaboration. Uh, we adopted in our strategic plan four priorities that still remain valid. And we're, we're still basing our work on these four priorities. One, obviously to enhance the regional organizational capacity to serve immigrant families with legal services, to also deliver those services, not only in the urban centers where those organizations were based, but to take them out to small, medium-sized cities throughout the entire Central Valley to make them accessible to people who very often did not have um, transportation, uh, or if they did have transportation, for example, um, if they uh, asked a neighbor or someone else to take them to Fresno to get legal services, they would often be charged a hundred dollars or some, or even more to get a round trip transportation to go to Fresno. And to also deliver uh, reliable, trustworthy communication and information to the people and to engage in local level, state level, and possibly federal level advocacy on behalf of immigrants. Those have been and were our priorities from the start, they remain uh, the case. So through this effort, um, we began to coordinate our efforts to develop a, a, an online calendar for planning events. We began to organize meetings in an ongoing basis. We began to offer training opportunities to partner organizations legal service providers and non-legal service providers to expand our capacity, to leverage our resources, to come together and organize those events throughout the entire Central Valley. And part of that, um, part of the results that we achieved in the following years was the organization and scheduling of over hundred legal services workshops uh, per year 
in addition to whatever was provided by, by each legal service partner in their respective offices. Uh, we organize events throughout the entire Central Valley. We organize hundreds of informational events per year altogether. Um, and the trainings that we provided to partners uh, in collaboration, for example, with Immigrant Legal Resource Center and other very highly recognized um, statewide and national agencies help to also connect the Central Valley communities and organizations with these broader national efforts. So for example, we also began to implement in the Central Valley, the New Americans campaign that many of you are probably familiar with that promotes naturalization efforts. So that was an additional resource that came into this region. And of course, we also shared resources that we developed on our own um, to share with the public as a whole and with our partner organizations. We also began to um, expand the activities that we began to focus on because many of our partners, for example, were very concerned with health issues. So in 2015, we created a health task force that brought together immigration and health. Later on, we also created uh, an immigration fraud task force that we had to dismantle afterwards because the authorities weren't doing much about it. We have not revived it this year. And uh, again, we also began to establish partnerships with other organizations in the Bay Area and uh, LA that also led to um, satellite offices here in the Central Valley. Next slide, please. So just um, some photos of some of our activities. On the left is um, a workshop that was held in the Dream Resource Center, which is a facility run by Fresno Unified School District, the largest district in the region that established a project that was also going to be promoting in, um, immigrant inclusion through its schools and creating safe spaces when Trump, the Trump administration came about and began to launch some of the uh, raids throughout the Central Valley. At the top, you see uh, an informational event held at a local school in the Central Valley. And in the bottom, you have uh, an image from one of the annual regional immigrant integration conferences that we've organized and that brought together partners uh, for a day long event. Next slide, please. Um, so the census has become very important to us and became very important to us from the 2018 to early 2021 effort. Uh, CIVIC began to become involved in census activities uh, in late 2017, early 2018. We were invited to participate in census studies that were looking into the possibility of unconventional housing where immigrants and other hard to count uh, residents lived and that would be ignored if uh, they were not included in the census uh, count. Um, so we began to become involved in that effort uh, and one of those studies uh, also was very significant in that it tried to uh, look into the possibility of exploring how immigrant families throughout the Central Valley perceive the possible inclusion of a citizenship question in the 2020 census. Uh, that, uh, those studies uh, were very important. The one on the citizenship question, for example, was utilized to, for some of the amicus briefs that were filed in federal court and also in the Supreme Court. So we were very happy to see that the Central Valley had an impact on that level as well. But we also began to become involved in census efforts in other ways. One, uh, I was fortunate to be invited by the governor of California to be part of the statewide complete count committee that will be providing advisory information to the state census efforts. So that allowed me to be exposed to a lot of what the state of California was doing with respect to the census and to share that information, those resources, the contacts with our partners in the Central Valley. And um, the state of California also began to organize in the spring of 2019, 2018, I'm sorry, a series of reg regional meetings dealing with the census. But then when they had these meetings, they would take off to the next place and there would be no follow-up. So we began to see that there was a gap that needed to be filled. And we began to contact partner organizations here in Fresno, then in other counties throughout the Central Valley to see how we could continue that dialogue over the census and begin to provide trainings and other resources that they needed in order to become fully engaged in the census and then transmit that information and engage the communities that they served. So this is something that we began to undertake in the summer of 2018 and we continued it for the next couple of years. Um, we, we were at uh, that point in time receiving funding from a, a, a foundation that uh, just was willing to invest in us in this pilot work dealing with the census. And at that point in time, there was no other organization that I knew about throughout the entire Central Valley 
that had any type of census funding. So it was important for us to share those resources with a much broader audience of organizations. And we began to see in the work with the census, um, sort of a repetition of we, what we had seen before with immigration, a lack of coordination at the regional level, a need for training, for updates, for resources, and then also a desire to work together and to, and to come. Um, this was very useful for us because it also exposed us to establish relations with a much, much broader network of, uh, of organizations and partners throughout the entire Central Valley. It went beyond our safety zone with immigrant serving organizations to expand our contact with many, many, many more organizations. Next slide, please. So um, this is a, a photo with one of the regional convenings that was held in January uh, 2020. That was the last in-person census event that we had in collaboration with a very important foundation here in the Central Valley uh, called Sierra Health Foundation that runs a program called San Joaquin Valley Health Fund. We we're a part of that. So um, some of the lessons from the 2020 census activities that again began in 2018 and continued up until this year, we were exposed to many more organizations we saw also that through the census efforts that it made sense to promote a regional approach to coordinate our efforts, to share our resources, to leverage our expertise, our knowledge, and so on and so forth. And the collaboration was facilitated in part of the Central Valley because the organization, the agency that received a lot of the state funding to operate from um, Madera, from Fresno County to the South, was one of the fund organizations that, uh, that I just mentioned right now, the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund. They received a lot of money from the state to be able to invest in census coordination and collaboration. They also had to engage with county authorities, with nonprofit organizations and others. So it made a lot of sense and made it possible to promote this regional collaboration. Um, the region as a whole, the San Joaquin Valley was considered a hard to count region because of the existence of rural communities, low income families, minority communities, immigrants, and, and Native American communities, among others. And we were fortunate that through the engagement of many, many different types of organizations that receive funding or just volunteer the resources and engagement and activism, we were finally at the end of the enumeration process able to surpass the self enumeration uh, numbers that had been achieved in 2010. Uh, which taken into account the pandemic and the limited um, outreach that was being able to be done in 2020, I think was a really uh, significant achievement here in the San Joaquin Valley as a whole. Next slide, please. So some of the post uh, census priorities for us that uh, again, immigration is still our priority. We're obviously very concerned about what might take place at uh, the federal level with immigration relief either a comprehensive immigration reform that is very difficult at this moment in time, but even if there's partial relief for some of the immigrant subgroups like dreamers, like farm workers, if either of those, for example, is approved in some way or another, it would really put um, a lot of stress on the Central Valley's organizational capacity because we'll be receiving thousands and thousands of people who would be interested in applying for those services. So our capacity is still very limited and inadequate and we need to, once again, at this point in time, go back to improving uh, the model of regional collaboration and find other solutions to potentially serve a much larger number of people. So we do want to um, continue to enhance this, this uh, regional capacity. Next slide, please. We're also uh, becoming involved and in taking baby steps. Uh, my particular organization, to become engaged in redistricting because many partner organizations that were involved in the census see redistricting as the logical next step also in the regional collaboration that can ensure that our democratic political system is actually representative of all citizens and that the redistricting process is going to result in a fairer uh, uh, way of including all residents here in the San Joaquin Valley. So some partner organizations have already been actively involved in redistricting efforts in the past they're utilizing that knowledge to become involved. Uh, we're beginning to establish partnership, partnerships with different organizations that are involved in this process, including Naleo, um, that, uh, as you know, has a lot of expertise in this. 
And the image that you see there is from the California Citizens Redistricting Commission that is the one in charge at the state level carrying out these efforts. So that's at the state level. There's also the local county levels that we need to become involved in. And we want to leverage these different resources dealing with immigration and census collaboration to also become involved in redistricting efforts. Next slide, please. And here's um, what I really hope will be very important and successful for us. And this is thanks to Welcome in America that we found out about it. As we had discussed with our partner organizations and the board of Civic, our immigrant um, advocacy and integration efforts, we also found out at the end of last year about this one region initiative that Welcome in America and the Atlanta region piloted in 2018. And when I found out about the one region initiative that had been piloted in Atlanta, I saw that like a really great model for us to develop something similar here in the Central Valley that we could develop and implement at the regional level. Because we've been involved in local level immigrant integration efforts, but going by city by city, community by community or county by county is going to be very difficult given the huge um, size of this, of this region. And when we saw the One Region Initiative, we, saw, we right away thought that this could be a logical, reasonable solution to try to develop something that would be promoting a model of immigrant inclusion, but at the regional level. So we have begun to take some of the baby steps to move in this direction. We see it as an effort that's going to be taken again, a year and a half to two years to really put it together and come together, but we're moving in that direction. And we wanna thank Welcome in America and the people who are involved in this in the Atlanta region, uh, because we are following your model, we're using your guides, the documents that I've been able to find and the conversations with, uh, with George Savala, among others from Welcome in America to help us better understand uh, what the One, One Region Initiative is and we are moving in that direction. So I really wanna be thankful to Welcome in America for uh, making this available to people like us here in the Central Valley. Uh, and we want to make this a priority for us that will make, will make it possible to engage more local gov level governments, chambers of commerce, the private sector, in addition to all the partners that we've been able to work with over the years in the different areas. Next slide, please. And that is it. <laughs> on, on my part, I think I may have gone uh, over time. Uh, there's my contact information. I'll be more than happy to chat with anyone, um, Jesus at civic.org and a couple of our websites, civic.org and biocentral.org. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Jesus. And uh, thank you for calling out uh, the One Region program. Um, I'm going to make sure to mention that to the staff that has worked on that. I'm sure they'll be thrilled to know that. So thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions for you, but in the interest of time, I wanna save those uh, and allow our next presenters to get through their content and then we'll take all the questions at the very end there. So hold tight for that. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over now to Doug and Paulina for their portion of the presentation. We're very excited to have them joining us. Uh, so Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you uh, to everyone for having us here. It's, it's a real pleasure to be a part of this uh, conference and to learn a lot about what's happening in the United States of America and to share with you a little bit about how we are working with community-based uh, newcomer integration here in Canada. I wanna start out just by uh, mentioning that I am coming to you today from Jasper, Alberta, which as you can see from behind me is in the Rocky Mountains here. And Jasper is located in the traditional territories of the Beaver, Cree, Ojibwe, Shuswap, Stony, and Métis people. And I just want to acknowledge that we do this work of newcomer settlement within the context of a broader imperative to work towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in, in Canada here. So what I want to do, to, uh, what Paulina and I are going to talk to you uh, a little bit about today is um, the Local Immigration Partnership Program, which is a Canadian effort at uh, supporting community-driven uh, strategic planning around newcomer needs in communities. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of that program, talk a little bit about establishing a local immigration partnership in my small community, and then turn it over to, to Paulina to talk a little bit about the context of her local immigration partnership in the big city of Toronto, and a little bit about our national level collaborations. So the local immigration partnership model is something that is supported by our uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, which is our federal government 
uh, immigrant, uh, Immigration and Refugee uh, Service Department. Um, it stems really from a 2008 uh, effort from Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada to modernize the approach to settlement and to recognize the importance of local level engagement in newcomer integration. Uh, it's based on a sort of two-way street model uh, of newcomer integration that envisions the need for adaptation on the part of newcomers to the country, as well as the need for adaptation on the part of host communities. And so the model works by um, supporting local organizations in communities with grants or contribution agreements from, again, the Government of Canada to support the development of community-based partnerships. And the purpose of those partnerships is to develop and implement strategic plans around newcomer settlement and integration in the community. So LIPS work by bringing together what we think of as traditional and non-traditional partners in the settlement world. It's a holistic community-based approach that engages with partners that might've historically been involved in, in newcomer settlement settlement agencies, settlement service providers, as well as non-traditional partners, which might include employers, uh, police forces, schools, or other organizations in a community that don't necessarily think of themselves first and foremost as being involved in immigrant and refugee settlement. Local immigration partnerships can be housed in municipalities or nonprofit organizations. Typically one organization will be a, a grant holding or a contribution agreement holding a, a organization. And that organization will provide the organization and collaborative support for the partnership. However, the work of a local immigration partnership is envisioned as a collaboration between the partners as a whole. The central kind of element or um, institution of a local immigration partnership is the partnership council. And that is a strategic planning and action planning board that again is, is made up of traditional and non-traditional partners. It is intended to be diverse, broad-based, uh, inclusive of, of a range of community level stakeholders. It should include well-networked and influential leaders in the community. It should include multiple levels of government, local, provincial, federal, it should include civil society, employers, other labor market organizations, perhaps media service providers, umbrella organizations like large uh, um, NGOs in the community. LIPS typically also uh, include a newcomer council or a newcomer advisory group, which is a council made up of immigrants and refugees in the community who advise the project and provide that newcomer lens, uh, a sort of first-hand perspective on the challenges facing newcomers in the community and newcomer needs in the community. And between the Partnership Council and the Newcomer Council, the objective is to develop and implement strategic plans that look at the community as a whole, that assess newcomer needs and community needs, and develop strategic plans to address those needs in a sort of collaborative function, in a collaborative manner. Uh, next slide, please. So again. You're muted. I believe I, sorry, I muted myself there briefly. The, uh, the process that LIPS go through is an iterative process in which they, they engage in research, planning, action, and assessment of those actions. And then that sort of brings back to a research phase to assess and research, determine the efficacy of those efforts to develop new strategic plans and new action plans to address issues as they develop and evolve in a community. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so that's a, a sort of a broad overview of this plan. Again, just to summarize the the model works that the, the federal government, Immigration, Re Refugees and Citizenship Canada provides funding to a local organization to establish the sort of backbone secretariat of a community-based partnership that engages a breadth of partners in strategic planning and action planning around newcomer needs in the community. Now, I live in a small town in the Rocky Mountains, uh, a town of around 5,000 people. And in 
2017, this type of funding was provided to the town of Jasper to establish a local immigration partnership. And so that funding was awarded to the municipality of Jasper. Um, that um, meant that it was the responsibility of the municipality of Jasper to establish a partnership, to bring together partners, and to engage those partners in a strategic planning process, and eventually the implementation of that strategic plan. Uh, next slide, please. With that came a number of opportunities and a number of challenges. So in this small town that I, that I live and work in, there had long been a tradition of collaborative uh, community-based uh, planning and implementation of human services. And that meant that we were sort of overlapping this local immigration partnership over an existing collaborative uh, infrastructure, if you like. Being a small town, however, that meant that there are a limited number of players, a limited number of motivated individuals who want to be involved in this type of collaborative planning, and they're already, in large part, engaged in it. So it was a matter of sort of fitting this new model and this new approach into an existing collaborative landscape. Um, there's also the issues of the sort of structural makeup of the community being a tourist town. We have a lot of entry level um, employment opportunities and limited opportunities for people to sort of move up through uh, uh, promotions and, and through levels of employment. And so we had to deal and still have to deal with the challenge of helping people integrate and settle in a community that isn't necessarily set up for everyone to stay long-term. There's a certain amount of transience built into the community structurally. So that's one of the challenges we faced. Also, generally speaking with local immigration partnerships, there's a, cha there's a challenge of ownership. As I mentioned, these grants and contributions are given to a single organization that is then tasked with creating and sustaining the partnership. However, the partnership is the joint responsibility and ownership of all of the partners. So there's always a challenge in creating that sense of collective ownership and collective responsibility when there's sort of one organization that's receiving the funding and in contractual terms, one organization that's responsible for delivering on the contract. Um, there are also challenges around connecting with newcomers. In a small community, there might be, a, it, it might seem that it's somewhat easier to go out and connect with people because of the small numbers, but at the same time in small communities, you tend not to have things like ethnocultural organizations or specific cultural or community organizations in, in which you can identify leaders and connect with. So those are just some of the, the challenges of creating this partnership in a small community. Um, but I'm very happy to report that we've been quite successful in overcoming those challenges. And in many ways, the introduction of this program into the community has really put newcomer settlement on the map, whereas this community and its economy has long relied on immigrants and newcomers to Canada. There has never been a formal uh, attempt or formal focus on assisting newcomers in settling, integrating and succeeding in the community. This partnership has changed that and has put the importance of newcomer settlement and integration at the forefront of community planning and in people's minds. Um, so I know that's been a very brief and maybe somewhat quick overview of, of both the program and of my experience with the program in this small town. But in the interest of time, I like to sort of stop there and pass it uh, on to Paulina to talk a little bit more about the local immigration partnership in the city of Toronto uh, and our national level collaboration between local immigration partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, I would also like to begin with a land acknowledgement that's specific to the city of Toronto. Toronto is based on the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements and is home to many Indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Métis. These treaties and other agreements, including the One Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other Indigenous nations, Europeans, and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace, and friendship. We are all treaty people. 
Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. We are mindful of broken covenants and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. I would also like to acknowledge those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. And so I honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. Thank you. Can I uh, have the next slide? Thank you. So the Toronto South Local Immigration Partnership is one of the oldest in Canada. Um, it was established in its current form in 2012, but that happened through the amalgamation of three pre-existing local immigration partnerships, whose origins date back to actually before 2008. Uh, and this is significant because our, our LIP actually predates the government funding that Doug has, has referred to. So we, in our communities, there was a community project aimed at um, coordinating services to newcomers. And out of that project, the LIP emerged. And it was, it was those original LIPs that then attracted funding. Also, it's significant for the reason that when the three lips came together, we decided to come together as a, in a collaborative consortium model. Uh, so unlike a lot of the lips in Canada, we don't only have one um, agency that gets all the funding. Um, my organization, uh, the neighborhood group, is the grant agreement holder, but we funnel funds to two other organizations. Uh, would be in community services and the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. Also, unlike Doug's LIP, uh, ours is community based. Uh, so again, the, the LIP, uh, organize, the lead organization of our LIP um, is a community organization, the neighborhood group. It's not a municipality. Can I see the next slide, please? We also exist in a very, very different context. Um, our context is a very complex settlement landscape. For instance, I have 69 member agencies on my partnership council, and I would say the vast majority of them are service providers who work with newcomers regularly. Um, we are one of five LIPs in Toronto. We're not the only LIP in our city. Um, there's one municipal LIP, the Toronto Newcomer Office, and four that are community-based. Um, Toronto is the biggest city in Canada. Uh, the city itself, the core city, has a population of 3 million, uh, but it swells to over 6 million if you include the suburbs. And over half of us were born outside of Canada. So again, a very high proportion of newcomers within that. Next slide, please. The context that I just described shapes many of the challenges and opportunities that are open to us. Um, some of those opportunities are that we have many very progressive partners with a very long history of helping newcomers integrate. Uh, some of the oldest settlement houses in Canada are based in Toronto South. So there are, I have members on my council who are more than 100 years, their organizations are more than 100 years old. Uh, they have a lot of credibility, a lot of experience in providing um, settlement uh, services to newcomers. Um, they're very strong, usually on, on social justice. Uh, they have a lot of credibility. They're not easily cowed by anything or anyone, and they have very strong opinions. Um, because we are a community-based project uh, and we emerged from the community, we, we have quite a bit of credibility with partners. So we do, our partners do tend to have a sense of ownership over the project, um, and, and they hold quite a bit of sway in terms of its direction and implementation. Uh, we also, I think, have credibility with our funders. So uh, our funder, our primary funder, which is the federal government, does understand our context. And for the most part, they've been very supportive of us. Um, they understand that our credibility lies in taking our cues from the communities that we serve. Uh, and so they've, they've been very sort of, they've allowed us a great deal of leeway and freedom in terms of how we implement our projects. Um, I would also say that all levels of government uh, in, that affect Toronto understand newcomer integration as a priority. Uh, they, they understand the context uh, of Toronto, of, you know, half the population being foreign born uh, and why it's important to have services that are well coordinated. Um, 
and that in turn opens up access to resources and opportunities. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think compared to many of the other LIPS across Canada, um, I have a significant, I mean, still not a large team, but it's, it's bigger than a lot of other LIPS. I, and um, we are able to attract sort of new opportunities as they come up. The same context also creates some challenges for us. Uh, because it's such a complex landscape, uh, we are often dealing with conflicting competing priorities uh, among partners and also between partners and levels of government and partners in the community. Um, often those priorities, in addition to the emerging priorities currently, there's also a lot of history there. So there are entrenched relationships between the partners, both supportive and competitive, um, that can scuttle certain projects. Uh, my partnership council, as I said, is, is very heavily uh, dominated by um, immigrant service providers, which is great in the sense that, you know, they have a strong understanding of community newcomer needs, and they, they are very willing to push forward public education campaigns and sort of in advocacy campaigns on behalf of newcomers. Um, however, it does mean that because part of our mandate is to serve as a bridge between uh, the newcomer serving sector and other organizations, sometimes those other voices can get drowned out. Uh, so for instance, even though we, you know, we still do have um, school boards sitting on our council and the police, et cetera, they are clearly, they're not the ones driving the agenda, which is both good and then challenging because it means that they are less interested in participating because they have a less of a, less of a voice. Um, another challenge is that for us, it's very difficult to measure impact and attribution. So in, in speaking with small town lips, I'm often a little bit envious because it seems to me like they can, you know, fairly easily identify, first of all, where the biggest need is among their newcomers and then work uh, through a collective impact approach to address that. So let's say that you know you're in a small town and uh, you decide that the biggest barrier for to newcomer integration is lack of employment. And so your strategic plan becomes focused on facilitating good employment. And you can measure the impacts and be fairly confident that it was your partners that helped bring that about if there is a positive shift. Um, I don't have that luxury. You know, we create a strategic plan with multiple directions and competing priorities. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, it's much more difficult to gauge whether those projects that we implement actually achieved anything, because there are just so many players at the table and such a large number of newcomers that attribution becomes extremely challenging. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna switch gears now and talk a little bit about the National Lip Secretariat, which is the project that both Doug and I co-lead. Um, our mandate is to enhance lip communication and collaboration across Canada and to augment lip voices at relevant stakeholder tables. So there are currently around 77 lips across Canada, but not all of them are equally robust and not all of them have the same history. Um, many of the LIPS, I think, especially out West are a little bit newer and they were rolled out only several years ago. As they started being rolled out, I think all the LIPS realized that we needed to communicate with each other more formally. So there was a grassroots kind of swell and effort to create some kind of loose um, network uh, where we could at least talk to each other through a platform called Basecamp. Uh, but it wasn't very systematic and it wasn't coordinated. Um, until the, around 2018, where um, the Calgary LIP held the LIP learning event. And at that LIP learning event, people really started talking about, we need a secretariat. We need some kind of body that can talk to the LIPs as a whole, gather up LIP needs, help with some, help support the newer needs, uh, help support the newer LIPs, and help bring our concerns more to the attention of decision makers because we had all the sort of grassroots expertise. We heard what the communities were saying, what newcomers needed on the ground, and then we weren't sure really how to communicate that effectively to the government. So that was the beginning of the National Lip Secretariat, and it came about through the formation of a working group, uh, an open working group. So any lip across Canada that wanted to join uh, was welcome to. 
uh, we ended up with about 10 lips that would meet remotely um, once every couple of months to talk about how we're going to get this thing off the ground. And we were able to secure some funding for it in 2019. Uh, and since then, we, we've had quite a bit of support from the government for furthering this initiative. Um, I would say that uh, the real value of the National Secretariat, we, it feels like we came into our own during COVID. So I'm going to ask you to move to the next slide. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we did during COVID-19 as the National Lip Secretariat and why that was important. So first of all, when COVID first hit, you know, everybody pivoted to remote service delivery initially. And some were more able to do that than others, uh, depending on what their working model looked like to begin with. But everybody was looking for information and accurate information. Uh, there were new guidelines and policies coming out from the government every day, and it was very difficult to keep up with it. And so we ended up sort of playing a bit of a coordinating role where we were making sure that the information was getting to the right people in a timely manner. Part of how we did that was by serving as a conduit between the local immigration partnerships and the National Settlement and Integration Council. So this council is... is one of the primary ways that the federal government in Canada talks to the immigrant serving sector. Uh, and it's, it, you know, it talks about policies, but it also keeps the sector informed on what's happening. Um, Doug and I were nominated and secured a position on the council. And so we were able to pass along that information to the LIPS in a timely manner. And then when LIP challenges came up during COVID, we were also able to feed that information back to the table. Um, in the last year, we also organized multiple professional development opportunities for LIPS nationally, and the ones that I want to highlight are the anti-racism uh, workshop series. I think in Canada, as in many other places, um, COVID-19 really highlighted the inequities and inequalities faced by in racialized newcomers in particular. Uh, often they are essential workers. Uh, they face barriers in accessing healthcare. Uh, they disproportionately are um, at risk of COVID because of the housing situations and the, the low income communities in which they live. Uh, and so I think LIPS really realized that we need to engage in more anti-racism work in our communities to fulfill our mandate of creating truly welcoming communities. So the National LIPS Secretariat organized a series of five workshops. The first three were intended to provide a kind of basic understanding of where anti-racism is at now and what, you know, what the vocabulary is and to ensure that the LIPS had the language around it and that we were more or less on the same page around the issues. Um, the fourth workshop was focused on the media and how local immigration partnerships can start to talk to the media and to others outside of our immediate partnerships around these issues in their, in their own communities. Um, and then the final workshop of the series was a roundtable where we asked LIPS to sort of talk about the initiatives that they're already engaging in, the anti-racism initiatives, how that's going, and to th start thinking about next steps for LIPS in that regard. We also really stepped up our efforts to um, promote online collaboration among the LIPS, including exploring a new platform, settlenet.org. Uh, and organizing an online LIP learning event uh, where LIPS could exchange best practices and talk about sort of their emerging concerns. Uh, and we surveyed the LIPS quite heavily this year to both to sort of capture their needs uh, and also talk about what initiatives they might want to take up collectively moving forward. Um, so I think that's, that's it for my presentation. And I think Doug and I are, would be happy to answer any questions that might come up. Great. Thank you both, uh, Doug and Paulina, for that. Um, Doug, I know you've been answering some questions in the chat, um, so thank you for doing that. Um, some good, good questions coming in there. Um, I will say, unfortunately, we are at our scheduled end time, um, so this has been an awful lot of great information that has been shared, um, and I do want to stay respectful of everyone's time. So uh, what I will say is what we'll do is I'm going to get with our speakers who have, again, given so much great information here uh, and share questions that have been entered into the chat post-event. And then we'll follow up with you afterwards uh, and share their responses uh, via document after this. So 
Your questions will be responded to. Keep them coming. I see questions coming in right now, which is great. Um, but yeah, this is such an important topic and there are so many questions around uh, the amazing uh, programs and resources that you all have put together and how you've done such an amazing job. And so uh, I would love to share these questions with you all and, uh, and we'll get back with all of our attendees. So thank you all so, so much for this uh, amazing presentation and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the audience here. Um, quick reminder to everyone, um, all of the sessions, including this one, are being recorded. Uh, we have the sessions from yesterday, the sessions today. These are all going to be made available to you uh, probably next week uh, via recordings. So uh, we'll actually send out a notification once those are ready to go. And uh, you can revisit this session as well as any of the others that you weren't able to attend uh, and get all the content there. So uh, we're excited to be able to share that with you. Um, if you are um, a member of the Welcoming Network, we hope we will see you in about 15 minutes for the member only networking hour. Um, but if you're not a member, uh, we do invite you to go to our website, uh, welcomingamerica.org. And there you can sign up not only for our newsletter, uh, but you can also uh, visit our page on membership and learn more about the different levels of membership as well as the benefits. Uh, we also invite you to reach out to us at membership at welcomingamerica.org. If you wanna learn more, we'd be happy to talk with you about that. So um, if you can't join us for the member uh, happy hour that's coming up, uh, this actually does conclude Welcoming Interactive 2021. And we hope you've all gained some great new ideas, you've been inspired uh, and hopefully made some great new connections. We know this has obviously been a very different year for all of us. Uh, this was our first virtual event um, and we are very thrilled that everyone was able to join us here. Um, thank you again for your time, for sharing uh, that with us. And we're very excited to hopefully see you all next year in Charlotte, North Carolina. So be well, everyone. Thank you again for joining. Have, have a good day.